<laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Robert Keston, Executive Director of Stonewall um, National Museum and Archives. And, and I like to add library, since this is all about books. And I want you to know that uh, this month, we are launching our Women's Fund at our Her Story event, which will be on July 29th here at our building at 1300 um, East Sunrise Boulevard in Fort Lauderdale. Everyone is welcome. The event is free. And it's our opportunity to announce this effort to achieve parity between women and men in our archive, our library, and our programming. So therefore, it is not a surprise that we have a woman writer talking about a woman writer uh, because every story needs to be told and told fairly and equally and with the same amount of respect. So I hope that those of you who can will attend the event. Those of you who can't attend will consider contributing to it because the more money we raise, uh, the more quickly we will be able to achieve the goals of getting the books and the archives and the programming that we need in order to make sure that every woman's story, every trans woman's story, every girl's story, and every ally story can be told. Because when we look at LGBTQ history, especially in the AIDS years, we recognize that many of the most outspoken supporters of our community were women who were allies. And you had Elizabeth Taylor, you had Matilde Krim, you had Judy Peabody, you had a whole host of women who stood up and were counted. And few more poignant moments than when Doris Day stood with Rock Hudson as he came out and said he was dying of AIDS. Uh, those were important moments that galvanized our community and made it possible for us to push and allow ACT UP and other organizations and institutions come to fruition to fight the AIDS crisis. And important lessons were learned, some unfortunately forgotten, that have resulted in a political situation today where we once again are trying to find our way as governors and state legislators and federal legislators look to push us back into closets that we will not return to. So with that in mind, it is really appropriate that we're talking about Alison Bechdel's uh, work as a political, very out, very engaged lesbian writer uh, and, and thought provoker. And so I'd like to in welcome uh, Janina Utel, uh, who is a writer, author of, and I'm gonna read it because it's a lot of stuff with a lot of words, of engagements with narrative and James Joyce and the revolt of love, marriage, adultery, desire. Um, I think I screwed that up, but um, <laughs> you can correct me. Uh, she serves as the editor of Space Between Literature and Culture, 1914 to 1945, a peer reviewed digital journal, and certainly, and now serves in New York as the program manager for professional development for the Modern Language Association. Another mouthful, but one that is uh, very exciting, especially in today's world. So welcome, Janine, and let's start wherever you want to. Um, if you want to introduce the conversation with your slides, that would be great. Um, otherwise, you, you lead, okay. and I will follow. Great. Thank you so much, um, Robert, for that introduction. And it's wonderful to hear about this initiative um, at, the, at the Stonewall Museum and Library. And thank you for inviting me and thank you to the library and the museum for having me. This is really just a wonderful, wonderful place to be, especially now. Um, so if it's okay, I'm, I have some slides. I'm not a big slide person. Um, they're really just kind of prompts and a couple of sort of, you know, visual, visual pieces for while I'm talking. And what I thought I would do is um, begin with a little bit of a reading from my introduction to the book, The Comics of Alison Bechtel. And I thought I would do this just to kind of um, situate my interest in her work 
in the field of queer life writing, which is um, one of my areas of expertise and also one of the things I find so compelling about her as a writer and an artist. Um, and then as Robert has noted in his introduction, in, in his introductory remarks, there's lots of other directions that this could go. Um, I'm presuming quite a bit of familiarity with Bechtel's work, so I'm not going to do too much of an overview or anything like that, but what I thought I would do through um, some attention to the introduction to the volume is draw out a couple of themes that I think we see across her, her body of, um, of graphic work and her writing. So um, it's sort of a general kind of look at Bechtel and then taking the conversation wherever it might go. And so um, I kind of, I come to my interest in Bechtel through an interest in life writing, particularly queer life writing. And for people who are interested in this, um, one of the sort of key thinkers that I refer to in thinking about queer life writing is uh, Wendy Moffat, who has, you know, she's written a biography of E.M. Forster. And what she's doing in her work is sort of, you know, ensuring that representation and visibility are critical to writing the lives of LGBTQ people. What are the, what are the as Robert was saying, where are the stories? What are the stories that need to be told? And how can this essential part of people be, be foregrounded in those stories? Um, and I used the word essential, and now I feel like I wanna sort of pull back on that or note it somehow maybe to come back to because um, of course Bechtel you know, thinks about how, you know, how gender works, how, you know, gender essentialism, gender performativity. She makes fun of theories of gender essentialism as well as theories of performativity. Robert and I were talking a little bit before this started about how Bechtel is very aware of theories about gender and sexuality and she draws on them and she communicates them but she also has a lot of fun with them. Um, and one of the essays in the volume um, from University Press of Mississippi looks at how Bechtel um, kind of takes theories and academic discourse, looks at what it might look like in the real world, but also paradizes it and satires it uh, in really interesting ways. So um, again, sort of major, major pieces in Bechtel's writing, um, of course, Dykes to watch out for, hugely important. And um, one of the things I think I'll suggest in my remarks, in my reading, is that I don't see Dykes to watch out for and the later work in any way being not coterminous. I think that there's a very clear trajectory in writing the self and writing the queer self and creating autobiographically inflected work across everything Bechtel is doing. Um, just as a quick note, this interest of mine extends to other aspects of life writing um, and comics life writing. I have a book about Howard Cruz coming out in February of 2023. Um, and I will talk a little bit about Bechtel's relationship to gay comics also. Um, because that's another really interesting place where we see in her early work, her kind of writing the self. Um, so this photo is from Bechtel putting together her uh, exhibition, her career spanning exhibition, Inappropriately Intimate, which started, I think it started at the University of Vermont. And um, that's kind of where I'll start as well. And the exhibit, if for those of you who might've seen it or seen it when it traveled, I think it was at Rutgers as well in New Jersey. Um, it was an invitation while also a pushing away. And so there was this great image that Bechtel did for the opening of the, the entrance to the exhibit where she was drawing and standing there with her pen, but also kind of looking over her shoulder, like you're here, do I want you here? Do I want you to come in? Yes, I do, no, I don't. And that sort of push and pull of intimacy and inviting the reader in while also setting up structures and labyrinths that we have to, we have to navigate, I think is part of her work. Um, so I'll sort of dive in to a couple of words here and then some more conversation. Um, Alison Bechtel has described her work as inappropriately intimate. She suggested the phrase for the title of the 2018 exhibition of her career, and it captures the transgressive and sometimes playful nature of many of her comics, as well as the demand she places on readers as they enter her private world. Bechtel has, and public, I mean, she's also inviting us into the community of her peers and her lovers and her friends in Dykes to watch out for. And that play of private and community, I think is also really, really critical. Um, Bechtel has used comics to explore multiple versions of her most private selves. In her work, we are invited into a world where the messy feelings of difficult and deep relationships are sounded and where things that challenge our ideas of what should be represented are. 
in meticulous, sometimes graphic detail. At the same time, entering into that world is itself challenging. Navigating the private histories of others, seeing the losses and traumas of others, bearing witness to their essential humanness. These are challenging acts artistically, narratively, and ethically, but they are what Bechtel calls on us to do. Bechtel is preoccupied with intimate lives, including her own, and with making varieties of intimacy visible in a variety of narrative forms. In the many interviews Bechtel has given about her life and her art, and in her own writing about her work, such as that collected in the 1998 volume, The Indelible Alison Bechtel, she offers herself up for scrutiny and continues to probe what drives her to represent her most private concerns. Her major works, Dykes to Watch Out For, Fun Home, Are You My Mother, and the most recent, The Secret to Superhuman Strength, bring us first into the lives of a lesbian community and later into the lives past and present of Bechtel herself. Um, on first look, it might seem like this is an interesting traje trajectory from comic strip to graphic memoir, autography, as the life writing scholar Jillian Whitlock talks about, um, comics that are memoirs. Um, but I would say um, that I don't necessarily see that. Bechtel believes that um, along with other, you know, from the very beginning of her career, along with other gay and lesbian comics artists from the 70s into the 90s, um, Mary Wings, Roberta Gregory, Howard Cruz, Diane DeMassa, Jennifer Camper, representation was critical, especially in the space of underground comics, which was often seen as heterosexist and misogynist. And Bechtel, along with Cruz in his work on gay comics, sort of pushing up against that. Um, and here's an image of the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookshop where Alison Bechtel bought her first issue her first copy of the first issue of um, Gay Comics. Dykes to Watch Out For is preoccupied with community and the intimate relationships that form and develop within the networks and bonds of that community. It imagines, even idealizes what it means to be out, to live openly and free from shame and prejudice. Fun Home, Are You My Mother, The Secret to Superhuman Strength seem to turn from the outside in. Layer by layer, the memoirs delve into Bechtel's relationships with her parents, um, the first focusing on her father and the second on her mother, moving backward and forward in time. And then the third, sort of thinking about herself, you know, over the course of her life and her own thinking about the, the relationship between her body and her mind and confronting what seems to be, what she seems to be thinking of as her, her own mortality. So sort of proleptically looking ahead to what the end of her life might be like. All of Bechtel's work, both the cartoons and the memoirs should be seen as concerned with relationality, with representing the intimate spaces of the self and that self in intimate relationship with others. For those of you who've read The Secret to Superhuman Strength, you see her thinking about what it means to be in relationship with others. And she draws on other writers and their relationships where we might've seen the solitary author, James Joyce, Marcel Proust in Fun Home or Virginia Woolf in Are You My Mother? In Superhuman Strength, we see Wordsworth and Coleridge. We see Emerson and Margaret Fuller. And that shift, I think, you know, reading and writers and other authors are critically important for Bechtel, but I, as she sort of routes her own thinking through them, but that turn towards relationships in the, in the most recent book, the third book, um, and the focusing on these pairs, these other ways of thinking about intimacy and kinship, I think are, are really very important. So um, all of Bechtel's work should be read as concerned with relationality, whether she is drawing the dykes of dykes to watch out for, sitting around a kitchen table, drinking wine and talking about politics or their lovers, or is drawing herself sitting in her therapist's office describing a dream or drawing herself skiing, falling down, hurting her knee and having that wound sort of, you know, stay with her the same way some of what she sees as psychic difficulties stay with her. Um, Bechtel makes visible the self out in the world alongside the inner world of the subject. Um, becoming a lesbian cartoonist, Bechtel has described um, that as being a fairly easy thing. By the time she came to work on Dykes to Watch Out For, she saw others as having paved the way, like Mary Wings and Roberta Gregory, who appear in the first issue of Gay Comics, which is the um, uh, lesbian gay men put it out on paper 
up in the corner. And then she herself wound up getting to do her own issue of Gay Comics, number 19, um, many years later. The whole issue is dedicated just to her work. When, by the time she saw the issue in the Oscar Wilde Memorial Bookstore, she writes, there was already such a thing as a lesbian cartoonist. I didn't have to invent it or fight for it or suffer over it. I just did it. But the challenge for Bechtel at the start was drawing women. And this, I think, is sort of interesting for, um, you know, if we go back to Robert's point about representation and the need for stories and, you know, sort of ensuring that women are, you know, not in a marginalized position. She had a really hard time drawing women, which she attributed to a sort of internalized misogyny. Um, since childhood, drawing men had been a way for her to work through strategies of representing, representing gender and sexuality and a means of practicing her craft, but she came to see it as neither personally nor professionally fulfilling. Attempting to represent women had proved an obstacle, even as being out as a lesbian and becoming more committed to a highly politicized feminism led Bechtel to see the necessity of drawing women. And she writes again in uh, The Indelible Alison Bechtel, as I grew more and more politicized, it began to rankle that my sketchbooks were devoid of women. To draw a woman involved not just a change of subject matter, but rewiring the circuitry that seemed to run directly from my subconscious to my pen. And I think this is fascinating. For those of you who know Are You My Mother, you know that the poet and that's my cat. Sorry, I think he's done torturing the other one now. Sorry, everyone. Um, you might know in Are You My Mother the importance of the um, radical lesbian feminist poet, Adrienne Rich, who herself went through a period of thinking about how form, poetic form, hampered her ability to think through what it means to be a, a woman subject, what it means to think through women's subjectivity. And I see Bechtel going through similar kinds of processes. How do we read the self, write the self, revise the self? And what does it mean to think about that in the context of form? And so this sort of early period is her thinking about what is the form for which I, you know, which I need to tell stories, to tell my story, to tell the stories of others. And I see also the work of the memoirs as continually revis revisiting that question. And so we find here and throughout Bechtel's ongoing concern with and belief in the power of representation also struggling to find and wield that power in a heterosexist and misogynist society, um, which again, she saw even in the world of comics, um, particularly underground comics. And so again, thinking about these things as kind of coterminous, it would also be the case, I think, to say that even as early as Dykes to Watch Out For, we see Bechtel thinking about versions of the self um, much of the work on Fun Home began during the run of Dykes to Watch Out For, and while the memoirs are more explicitly life writing or autography, the continuum of interests in selves and the nature of the subject, queer and lesbian identity and sexuality, gender performativity, the nature of embodiedness, embodiedness and relationality, and shared or troubled forms of knowledge and subjectivity, these extend over the course of the entire work. Um, her process is uniquely bodily and multimodal. Um, a number of people here might very well be aware that, that when Bechtel is composing her work, she uses digital photography to pose herself, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs, and then draws from those photographs to make the comics. Um, putting her own body into the work, right? And again, for, if you've read The Secret to Superhuman Strength, you know that that book is uniquely preoccupied with the relationship between the body and the mind, which I think she's sort of been thinking through over the course of, over the course of her career. And so now I'm just kind of skipping a little bit because nobody wants to hear me go on that long, I think. And so through the creation of these layers, these layers and layers of self-discovery and the work of an intimate personal archive, the life of her, the lives of her parents, her own art, her photographs. Bechtel reimagines what memoir and what comics can do, I think. Again, going back to that question of form, right? Breaking out of what we might think of as conventional comics form. 
um, in Are You My Mother, which I think is a really innovative and experimental and difficult kind of text, Bechtel has composed again a text that is recursive and allusive. I think even more so than Fun Home, this book is resistant to emotional and narrative closure. You go around and you go through and you see things reflected, but it's very, very hard to find that narrative closure. And I think that has a lot to do with the relationship that she's talking about, that, that relationship with her mother. Interestingly, I think some form of closure is achieved, narrative closure as well as you know, emotional closure in Superhuman Strength, where she comes back to that relationship with her mother. Helen Bechtel, who died in 2013, shortly after the publication of Are You My Mother? The two women had a very fraught relationship. Um, in the memoir, Bechtel represents her mother as being proud of her work while never really wanting to discuss its particulars and struggling with the ongoing acts of self-disclosure that drive Bechtel's art. And so just to, again, kind of go back to the current focus, important focus on women and women's writing, it seems like this relationship between these two women, one an artist, one a thwarted artist who you know, made attempts to be a writer as we see in Are You My Mother, um, the sort of conflict, the battle in what it means to have, you know, to, to sort of think through our mothers, as Virginia Woolf says, where are we finding stories that we can draw on? Where are we finding stories that are hard to tell or that couldn't be told? Um, Bechtel is telling stories for herself that her mother maybe never felt like she could tell for herself. And her mother recognizes that and is, you know, very conflicted about it. While Fun Home concludes with an image of the child Allison leaping into the arms of her father, famously, the final image of Are You My Mother shows the child crawling away from the mother. Um, and the image is sort of presented as kind of a God's eye view on the two, rather than the inviting coming into the pool that we see at the end of Fun Home. Are You My Mother takes self-knowledge, the journey into the self via memory and dreams as its central concern embedded within the narrative of attempting to come to terms with her mother via therapy and psychoanalysis, lensed through the theories of D.W. Winnicott, Virginia Woolf, writings by Virginia Woolf and Adrian Rich, is the story of trying to create fun home. Thus in one memoir, does Bechtel tell the story of the creation of another memoir, which was itself the story of the creation of herself as an artist and her understanding of herself as a lesbian. And so, Bechtel uses the delving into one version of herself in one memoir to account for the telling of another version of herself in another memoir, which she does again in The Secret to Superhuman Strength, which is also about trying to write The Secret to Superhuman Strength. And so the process of figuring out who she is and how, what it means to be a writer and what it means to be an artist is an endlessly sort of Mobius strip kind of a process, um, which incidentally she begins very, very early on with her own special issue of Gay Comics, wherein she writes Coming Out Story, which is backwards, which I think is fitting if I'm seeing it on my Zoom screen. Um, and it is a, why am I telling another coming out story? What is this genre? If I tell the story, does it not become fixed? Do I want this representation of myself to become fixed? So retelling over and over again, um, versions of herself. And incidentally, she sort of does another version of her coming out story in Fun Home. And so telling, retelling, retelling, and trying to find the right form for the story that she wants to tell. Do you find that yes. um, her whole work with um, Dykes to Watch Out For was also working through the mother issue to a large extent in the sense mm. of finding relationships that would work? Yes. Versus yes. relationships that were so contentious and so mm -hmm. uncomfortable and her father basically breaking a bond that uh she could never really address yes um, except for by coming out yes um, he hid for those of you who don't know her father was clo a closeted gay man who tried very hard to conform to 1950s 1960s life in America and ultimately couldn't deal with it and walked in front of a truck. Uh, but then everything she does is working through those two things, how to come home to her parents, 
-hmm. or how to find the replacement for those parents um, so that she can be whole. Yeah. Understanding yeah. that she may never be whole, mm -hmm. which she sort of comes to terms with and almost comes to enjoy. Um, and then adds the political elements, which she loves. I mean, she loves being political. Yeah, yeah. And, and spoofing everything around it. The idea of what a queer society is, what is lesbians. I'm surprised she didn't get your cats in there. Um. <laughs> I thought about that. I actually kind of was thinking if the cats act up, it would be perfect. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly perfect for for this story, yes. Yeah, okay. um, so all of those things seem to go hand in hand in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And the constant recreating the same story over and over again, told from different perspectives, from different angles, from different points of view, and, and going forward and backward, her, her adult self almost addressing her young self. Uh, no, don't worry about that because it will be okay. That won't be okay, but that will be okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the shock and surprise that you can do that in fiction mm -hmm. or in memoir or in graphic novels. Um, those are the kinds of things that I think are, are absolutely fascinating about what she does in a context that not too long ago would have been unacceptable that you couldn't have even put in the mail. Right, right. So there, if I could say, if I could kind of pick up on three things that you've just said, um, I love the bringing us back to Dykes to watch out for it through the working through of the relationship with the parents. And you're, Robert, you're kind of highlighting the relationships in the comic strip as somehow being another version of that working through, I think is so important. I'm thinking back to um, the drafts of Are You My Mother, which are at Smith College. And for those of you- Although they should be at our archive. Well, <laughs> you we'll have to, work, we'll have you to. all can work that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, and, um, you know, I'm sure many people here know this, but Are You My Mother started out, it was supposed to be a book about relationships. It was supposed to be a story of kind of working through all of the lovers that she'd had and why they didn't work out. And the way that it kind of morphed into a story about her mother, the relationships are still important, but it's almost as though she had to work through that story. She wanted to tell the story of the relationships, but she couldn't do it, Start, you know, starting with Dykes to watch out for, but she couldn't do it until she told the story of her mother. And then I think that's why in Superhuman Strength, we come back to that question about relationships. Why are my relationships not working? Why do I refuse to go and live in town with my, with my girlfriend? Why, you know, why am I achieving professional success, but personal failure? So I think that the, you know, the question of the parents is critical, but the, it's bookended, it's framed by what does it mean to be in relationship with somebody? Absolutely. And what, do, what is that relationship? Is it a partnership? Is it a form of kinship? What is, what is couplehood look like? Um, especially when like a couplehood that I'm familiar with, namely that of my parents, you know, looked like what that looked like. Well, but um, she also she also takes that a step further in saying, in a queer world, mm -hmm. are couples, or should couples even be the norm? Right. Or right. should we look at the expansion of what love is, and um, is monogamy the way it should be, or is that uh, something that is a convention that is being superimposed on us? rather than something that is natural to us as human beings. Mm -hmm. So I think that those elements also fit in there and that constant conflict. Uh, my relationships don't work out because, well, everybody knows that monogamy doesn't work. Right, right. My right, father right. fooled around with young boys. <laughs> my mother was miserable. Right, how could this possibly work? Right, right. Um, and then you're getting me to think too about sort of the early years of gay comics and your point about she's representing things that at a certain, you know, at for, you know, really much longer than it's been possible to represent them or to have people see them. 
much longer than that, you couldn't, right? And so by the time she comes to see, you know, like gay comics, for example, um, I always thought that her comment, I would never had to struggle with being a lesbian cartoonist because it was already there. I always thought that was such a fascinating thing to say. Like yes. I walk into, I walk into the bookshop and there is the thing I want to do. It didn't even occur to me I could do it, but of course I can do it. Here's a whole bunch of other people doing it. And the total lack of like conflict she felt over that to me is remarkable. She looked at those pages and, you know, a bunch of like, if I don't want to pull up my slide again, but when Cruz got Rand Holmes to do the cover for the first issue of Gay Comics, he was very concerned about what women would think. He was thinking, will this send a signal that this publication is just for gay men? Where will women find themselves in this publication? He was deeply worried about that. And that's why it was so important to him to have women like Mary Wings and Roberta Gregory be on board like right from the beginning. Um, and Bechtel didn't have any kind of a problem with this at all. She saw herself and she saw the work she wanted to do in those pages. Um, where, did and she, it, yeah. where did she doubt her ability? Did she doubt her ability? No, nor did, oh, she nor did, did not. she. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> right. Most people going into an arts field question mm -hmm. whether they're good enough, question whether they'll make it. It's all so competitive. And yeah. she doesn't seem to have ever doubted that she would meet with success. Yeah, but isn't, think about some of the work that she does later. Think about like, Are You My Mother? And think about The Secret to Superhuman Strength where those texts seem to be plagued by doubt. Oh, absolutely. No, I'm not saying that doubt was not there, uh, but, but not necessarily about her ability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as you said, you know, why am I suc so successful in my work, but not successful in my private life? So yes, she has doubts about what she's writing about because she's writing about herself right, and the right. failure of that person mm -hmm. with this great success. Yeah. I, my archives are at Smith. My this, I'm having a one person show that's traveling <laughs> across the country. Uh, yeah. That's all great, but I can't decide to go and live in town with another mm -hmm. person because mm -hmm. God, that's really it's not me. Much. Right, right, right. Well, you're making me think too about this question of doubt. So interesting. Um, not necessarily feeling doubt when she was doing the comic strip, because in some ways, well, that's not about me, right? It's when I'm writing about my, and I know we, I know I, I agree with you that when we look at, when we read Dykes to Watch Out For, we see, a, we see a continuum. But if she's thinking, I'm doing this comic strip, it's not about me, it's about people I know, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tapestry of my community. I don't feel doubt about, that work. I don't feel doubt about my ability to represent that. I do feel doubt when it's about myself. And where does that doubt come from? Like, what is that? I hate, I, I, I actually don't love using the word trauma to talk about Bechtel's work um, because I, I feel like it's limiting. Um, although there are a number of essays in the volume that approach yeah. Bechtel's work from that perspective. Um, but there is sort of like a, a wound there that is, that, that is doubt. And it's, I, I almost feel like that is the thing that preoccupies her. There's other things that she's working through, but the doubt keeps coming back. The doubt recurs. Well, I, I, you have to wonder if she ever, or how she felt love mm -hmm. from her parents. Right. Her father, whom she adored, killed himself. Mm -hmm. The mother who she didn't adore was problematic until she died. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. where did she feel that she belonged? I mean, her father's been dead for a long time now. Yeah, yeah. And she has a relationship with her brothers, but it's not part of her regular life mm -hmm. living with women. Right, right, right. So there is, yeah. It's that constant struggle of, Whose clothes is she really wearing? And mm. although she sees herself on the pages of other people's work in the sense that it was okay to be a woman drawing comics, mm -hmm. she doesn't necessarily look like those women. Mm -hmm. She doesn't carry herself like those women. She right. is a unique figure, even in her own world. 
Right. Right. And that's so fascinating. Um, and and for that strangeness or unusualness to have such success on Broadway, have such success in in other ar- avenues that you wonder what must be going through her head. Mm-hmm when she hears those songs, when she sees these characters come to life on stage. Mm -hmm. And you also wonder why it hasn't turned into um, either television or or film or something other, um, other than the women's market, because those industries are still controlled by men largely, have not felt that it would be commercial enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I'm think I'm I'm actually thinking if I could just kind of pick up on a couple of things that you've said that now I'm just like oh I need to write another book about Alison Bechdel. Um, so the one the something I did want to mention when you were talking about you know present Allison talking to past Allison, I think the play actually does a beautiful job with this, um, where you have the three versions of her. Um, kind of embodied there on the stage. And you wonder how in the world would you turn this into a musical? And I feel like picking up on the multiple versions of her in the text itself, right? There's the version of her that hangs out in the narrative panel, actually telling the story. There's the version of her that's drawn. Um, And, you know, there's even sort of like avatars of her like popping out in the comic strips and things like that there's many versions and the play lets you have all of them inhabiting the same space at the same time which i think is very cool um but when you were talking about clothes i'm thinking like i'm having like flashes of images from all of her work in my head right and there's mo's you know very characteristic striped shirt and there's the way that she's you know carries her body and the way that superhuman strength is so attentive to that, one of the ways it does that is through clothes. And so there are moments, and we, I think we might've mentioned this too, Robert, in our kind of opening, just kind of chat. There's moments where she's like pointing us to things like the fantastic big kind of um, cutaways of the house in Fun Home, where there's a bubble and an arrow and it's pointing to like the, you know, the, the sun, oh gosh, now I can't, sun, sun bright bread or whatever. And there's um, the little, uh, bu- there's a little bubble with the arrow that's pointing to the, um, uh, the mark on the wall where Bruce threw something one night in a fury. Secret to Superhuman Strength has these, their, their clothes, their, op- their, their clothing items like from L.L. Bean or Patagonia or something. And they've got their catalog number next to them and this happens throughout the book and you sort of see how these objects gather up the significance for her and as she kind of changes and as she picks up this fad or that fad she buys new things and the catalog number is next to them it's this fascinating archive of personal transformation that also depends so much on things on objects that but, but like she has acquired and that she holds on to. It's a totally new way of thinking about like her archive, which is something a lot of people talk about when they talk about her. Um, it's like there is a closet full of stuff in the book, which is just so, so interesting. Um, and then the last thing, if I could just say one more thing about, you know, in response to some of what you were saying, I'm also thinking about um, crying, the ways that she represents herself crying. There's not a whole lot of, you know, thinking about how did she feel love? What would this have been like? How did she, did she at all? There's not a whole lot of sort of depictions of outright overt emotion. When it happens, it's surprising. And the, the thing that popped into my head was when you were talking about her mother, at the end of Superhuman Strength, when she dies, she talks about herself keening, being in the empty room and keening which is like just sort of, I don't know, gripped me in some kind of a way. And I thought back to in um, Are You My Mother, where her mother makes her cry by telling her, I don't want to see your name on a book of lesbian cartoons. And that image shows up once at the beginning where she remembers it. And then later when she recreates it, first as a panel, then as a photograph, then 
as the photograph, her drawing. So it's like a, like a three layered image of the photograph, the panel, photograph becoming the panel of her crying over this thing that her mother said. There's this moment of emotion, but it keeps getting mediated back further and further away from the initial instance of like affective physical response. And I remembered seeing a, I think it was a New Yorker cartoon, like a little essay that she did when the musical came out. And it was about her crying over the songs and crying as she saw it in rehearsal and then listening to the, to the CD in the car and crying in the car and like so much, so just like tears, like tsunamiing out of her face. It was so striking because one, it was sort of neat to see like her representing her response to the musical. And I remember crying very ugly tears at the musical, but it was also like more tears than I think I've seen in her entire body of work. So, you know, if we go back to thinking about, you know, the body and the ways that she represents the body, like the body sort of exuding emotion and the ways that emotions can come from the body, that's not, that seems to be missing in some places. So where it shows up, it's fascinating. And I think that that's part of the charm is that yeah. it's not abundant. So when it does happen, right. it is surprising yeah. and more, much more powerful. So powerful. So yeah, there's excess and abundance, but not with not around that, right? There's thinking about, you know, pages of text and quotes from and, and know, lots of sarcasm, and so much, yeah, and, you yeah. know, and, and lots of of not outrageous, but definitely cruelty. Yeah. Um, you know, there's that there's the one scene where the two women and I don't remember their names are in the bed. And the one is le getting ready to leave, and one is says, um, "Well, I can't go with you because I have my thesis I'm working on, and I've got to get my degree. And yeah. you can't stay here because there's no room for your stuff. I mean, whoa, <laughs> no room for your stuff. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's the reason. And then the other one says, "Well, are you going to at least drive me to the airport?" Right, 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 right. I mean, oh, but yeah, yeah. It's it's uh, she just nails this the impossibility of certain kinds of intimacy. Yeah, they were having different conversations. Yeah, yeah, and I think she nails, as you're saying, she nails the the way that intimacy is made impossible by the all the ways that you can push somebody away. We, it's a catalog of how am I going to, you know, what are my strategies for ensuring that we are not intimate? And your point about there's, you're reminding me of the strip where, you know, there's no room for your stuff. I'm thinking back to like the pages of stuff in superhuman strength, right? The skis and the jackets and the fleece and, uh, you know, all the things she buys and there's rooms full of it. Of course, there's no room for your stuff. It, there's room for my stuff. There's only room for my stuff. <laughs> All and my that's stuff. Why we can't, and, and that's why we can never live together. Right, right, right. Because where would you live? Where would you live? Where would you put your stuff? <laughs> it's uh, just not possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of how she felt in her own home. Right. Oh, so much didn't... stuff there too. Right. And she yeah. and everybody was off doing their own thing and nobody really belonged together. Mm -hmm. And a family is supposed to belong together. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so so ironic that the person who has the mortuary commits suicide. Yeah. Yeah. Who is going to prepare the body when the person whose place it is is over? Right, right. Well, you're, can I ask you a question? Um, so people, including me, have talked about dykes to watch out for as presenting a kind of community, right? Um, in some ways, I, I, some people have said idealized. I don't want to say idealized necessarily, but, you know, people like these women can be together. They have their places they go, their, the spaces they move in are welcoming, right? Um, 
and she makes fun of it, right? Too, like Cafe Topaz and the vegan pizza and the, some of the stuff she does with pride is just hilarious, right? So it's community. I can almost, I can almost make fun of it because I feel so welcome here. I feel so totally at home. Um, but look, reading that back through the memoirs, I have a hard time saying about it what I've thought about it in the past and what some people have also said about it, which is she's imagining forms of intimacy and kinship that are possible, new forms of kinship that are possible separate from the family, separate from heteropatriarchy and all of, you know. I don't see her doing that imagining anywhere else. Like I don't right. see her seeing it as being possible at all. Not, right, even, that's at, the whole not point. even at the end, yeah. But, yeah. And then she uses queer theory as a way of justifying that mm. in the sense mm -hmm. that maybe that's not part of the world that we're supposed to live in. Why do we have to adapt to right. that world? That world and, and that whole thing on, on um, gay marriage or commitment ceremonies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. which you find in your book. Right. Um, <laughs> You know, where one says, oh, you know, I can't believe you sold out. Then the other one says, well, if you're going to sell out, at least I hope you're happy. And then the other person says, you know, what could be more uh, of a protest than adopting this, which has been excluded from our lives for so long? Mm -hmm. So the three points of view um, mm -hmm looking at this very complicated issue, which we are now confronting again when a Supreme Court justice says that it should be revisited. And I hope that a case comes to the court so we can decide whether the court should have ever made this decision. Right, right. So right. it becomes relevant once again, which she points out throughout her writing is that what goes around comes around and comes around and comes around. And yeah. that goes to what we're trying to do here at Stonewall, which is mm -hmm. make sure that every story is told so we finally can learn history as history really is, which must reflect women and the trans community and gay men and people of color and allies. We need everybody's story so that we can cut that chain so it stops having to repeat. Right. over and over and over again. But until we learn where we're making the mistake, we continue to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome, yet mm -hmm. we never get that different outcome. Right, right. So I just want to throw it out there. If anyone does have questions, um, please put them in the chat box um, or the Q&A box. And uh, this is fascinating since... She answers so many questions I think that people have um, about their own lives. Mm -hmm. And also addresses, even if hers was extreme to some extent, the family relationships. Right. And her reaction to it is so bold. Yeah. She's not only going to come out as a lesbian, she is going to be a professional lesbian. <laughs> you know, yeah, mom, yeah. it's, I'm coming out, but I'm not going part of the way. <laughs> I am going to be someone who makes a living at being <laughs> Full blown, yeah. Right, yeah. And, yeah. and with, with seemingly no hesitation, mm -hmm. I'm gonna dress it, I'm gonna march it, I'm going to write it, mm -hmm. I'm going to sell it, I'm going to be commercial about it. Um, that's who I am. Uh, yeah. I'm a professional. And my profession is being a lesbian. Yeah. And I'm going to teach other people how to do it, mm. the right way or the wrong way, by giving them little boxes of pictures with words that tell them exactly what to do. <laughs> so it's like an instruction manual. It's a, it is an instruction <laughs> You read it, I mean, for me, you read it and you say, it is an instruction manual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. This is how you have the conversation. This is how you deal with your friends. Right, right, right. And what's so interesting about that is, I, I love that when she tries to, not tries, but when she's asked or somehow determines that she will tell her own story and call it coming out story, 
she's making fun of the very idea that one Absolutely. needs to tell that story, right? So the sort of going back to form, right? The genre of the coming out story or the bucket that is labeled coming out story is an insufficient container for what it really means to live the kind of life that she's talking about. You find that in like the lived experience of the characters. Just calling something coming out story it doesn't give you what you need. Um, you get that by looking at all of the stories. Without a question of a doubt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Without a question of a doubt. Mm -hmm. she, she lived the story and then tries to put it in a box so that people will understand it, yeah, knowing yeah. that it will never fit in that box. Right, right. So right. then she tells it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it still doesn't fit in the box. Mm -hmm. And undoubtedly, over the course of history, she'll tell it again. <laughs> we can hope so, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's it, it's fascinating. And it's it's fascinating that people like you, no offense, um, and the other and the other people in the book write academically about her while she's making fun of you for writing academically about her because oh, yeah. she said this isn't academics this is life this yeah. is just real life this is yeah. my life yeah. and if you think you can dissect it and parse it and make it into a, a, a science good luck with that yeah yeah I met her actually I met her um at Rutgers do uh when the exhibit went there and I said you know I'm doing this book about you know your stuff. <laughs> and she looks me right in the face and she says, I love academics. I love that, I love hearing what they think it means this time. <laughs> and I was like, you're awesome. <laughs> I will make sure you get a copy of this book. <laughs> right, I love what you think about it this time. Right, because right. It doesn't matter, I'm selling books. It's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm thinking a little bit about uh, another strip that Bechtel was in, you know, found to be inspirational, which was Howard Cruz's Wendell, which is similarly, and that was, that was published in The Advocate um, throughout a lot of the 80s. And it's similar in this like cast of characters and looking at the culture and looking at the community and poking gentle fun. And it's, it's really, it's very, very different in that it's focusing so very much on a couple, right? It's, it's not doing here I am being like a professional lesbian representing my lesbian community. It's no, here are these two men and they wanna be together. And thinking about the, the ways, the two different ways that these strips kind of approach these stories and approach representation it's really sort of fascinating coming out around the same time and kind of, you know, one inspiring the other and the way that she took it in such a different kind of different kind of way. Um, so if, for people who in the audience who might not know it, I would recommend looking at both of them, the Wendell and Dykes to watch out for together in the context of thinking about representation um, and how these stories are told and one one set of stories approaching whether or not you can experience love very, very differently. <laughs> Which is her experience. Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. Looking for love, feeling that love is, it does, it, it, it almost never reaches the level that you hope it will reach. So you're mm. always somewhat disappointed or frustrated or, ready to cry <laughs> yeah yeah unless you're unless you're Alison Bechtel in the secret to superhuman strength and then you just like get on your bike or run 10 miles <laughs> or do, do yoga and you're back to being you know yourself in your body self-contained with your stuff from LLB with your stuff from LLB Patagonia really oh, Pat <laughs> even better yeah yeah so what would you want people to walk away with about her work and its relationship to the world that we live in today? 
the world we live in today. Um, I wish I could say that go, I wish I could say that the thing I would want people to walk away with is go back to the stories and think about how important representation and visibility are for us, you know, exactly as you're saying, Robert, when you, you know, you talk about the work that the, the museum and the library are doing now. Um, but I, I, I feel like in our moment, it's, it's not enough um, because it, how do you get those stories in front of the people who really need to hear them and see them? Um, one of the things that's so powerful about comics is it makes you see right? You think you cannot, you think you don't have to look, but it makes you see. And it's accessible. And it's accessible. Yeah. And so you can make statements with them that I think you can make, you can't make with other forms. If people were really looking, we wouldn't be experiencing what we're experiencing right now. Um, but I think that the ways the ways we can think about storytelling and representation as forms of activism, I think that that's, that's really, that's critical. That's, I mean, we joke about Alison Bechtel being a professional lesbian, but it was activism for her, right? Yeah. The decision to draw women was political. Absolutely. Um, and the recognition that that was so hard for her was political. And she actually, she quotes Adrienne Rich in Are You My Mother? And she says, she loves the point, she loves the part where Rich says the moment of feeling enters the body is political. And I think I would want people to think a little bit about the ways that intimacy itself can be political, feeling can be political. Storytelling is a way to create intimacy. It's not, it's not just representation. It's, am I, can I be in an ethical relationship with somebody else? And then can I realize that that means I am obligated to not harm them? And that, and on for that me, note, political. Yeah. Thank you so <laughs> much for your time and for the thank conversation. You. I truly enjoyed it. Thank um, you. For all of you out there, please consider once again, joining us at Stonewall Museum and Archive at stonewall-museum.org. Um, join us as a member, join us and support the Women's Fund. Come to the museum, come see the work that we're doing. Join us. This is a safe, friendly, welcoming place where everybody should find a fun home. Um, and uh, we call it a village green where Everyone is welcome, nobody is judged, and you are all part of our extended family. I hope if you come to Florida, you will come and visit us. I'm absolutely. Uh, Florida, <laughs> Florida needs a lot of visitors from New York. Yeah, uh, yeah. Florida needs all the help that it can get right now. Uh, and uh, you people who are on the call, people who are on Facebook Live, please remember us down here. Uh, we are battling for the very things that Allison writes about in her columns and her, some of her characters take for granted, here it's a, an everyday occurrence. So thank you again, Janine, for joining me. Uh, it was great fun. And I look forward to your next book. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you all for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>